Again. Uh, really excited uh, to be here. Can't over, over emphasize that. Um, before I forget, the you know on our table we have a, we do have prayer cards. Feel free to take those. Also, there's a piece of paper. Sign up um, if you want our month uh, by monthly updates of what God is doing, where we are, and where we're going. Uh, feel free to write down your email so that you can be able to get those emails as we send them. Um, so that's what one thing I wanted to mention. So uh, before we start, uh, open your Bibles this morning to the book of Philippians, chapter two, verse twenty-five through thirty. Philippians two, twenty-five through thirty. As we are turning there, um, you know, my wife and I are having a baby girl. Girl, that word always confuses me. Uh, uh, but we've been thinking about names. Even before we knew if it was a boy or a girl, we were thinking about names. And you have to understand something. My wife has been a teacher for 10 years. And so she's seen a lot of characters that, <laughs> that when I'm proposing a name, uh, probably doesn't uh, make it. There's no chance. And so that is because probably, and I don't know if there's any teachers in the room, that is because probably there's some characters attached to the name. And uh, it's kind of hard. So you just have to dig deep and find a name that is not attached uh, with any character. And so the same applies to uh, Bible characters, really. Uh, in the Bible, we have uh, names like Daniel, which mean, you know, God is my judge. We have uh, names like uh, Achan. And if you know anything about Achan, he was trouble. His name means trouble. Nabal, in the Bible, he was really foolish. His name means fool, a fool. Jacob, we know, he was, uh, he was a supplanter, a trickster, and that's what his name means. Barnabas, on the other hand, actually, his name, his real name is Joseph. Uh, uh, he was nicknamed Barnabas, which means encourager. So there's meanings in names. In the Bible, if you are to really dig deeper, some God, the, the names that God gave us, uh, in the Bible, they had meaning attached to them. Now, a character that we have today in Philippians chapter 2, verse 25 through 30 is a, is a name that we don't probably see often mentioned, like Paul in the Bible. He doesn't stand out like David or Abraham, but he's someone that played a very vital role in Paul's life. And his name actually is a Greek, comes, comes from Greek, which is... Uh, Man, uh, it's an Aphrodite, actually, Aphrodite goddess, which uh, me meant lovely at the time. And so uh, Epaphroditus in our text today came later on to being lovely or charming. And so from his character, I would like to propose to us, we don't have much about Epaphroditus in the Bible, but from his character, I'd like to propose to us that God wants us to be loving Christian. Amen. God wants us to be loving Christian. What are the characteristics that we see in Epaphrodite's life, life that makes him lovely or a loving Christian? Just to read this text uh, here, because for the sake of time I won't read, we'll just go through, uh, as we go through. In verse 25, we're going to see the, the first characteristic that Epaphroditus heard is that he was a balanced Christian. Epaphroditus was a balanced Christian. You know, if uh, you're driving uh, and one car goes, you know, gets a flat tire, you'll pull off uh, and probably use the donut to get to the nearest place where you can get your tire fixed. And the reason being is because your tire is out of balance. 
if you are to go to a dealership today to get a new car and you realize one tire is flat, you won't buy that car because the car is out of balance. And the same applies in our Christian life, and we don't think about this often. It's when one area in our Christian life is out of balance, we really bring reproach to the cause of Christ. We bring reproach to the cause of Christ when one area in our life is out of balance. And so Epaphroditus, really, if we were to look at his life, his, his life was balanced in most aspects in his life. This is what Paul says in verse 20, 25 about Epaphroditus. Yet I suppose it necessary to send Epaphroditus. The first thing he says is my brother. Now, you know, uh, most of us, when we forget someone's name, especially Dalmas, and you meet, at, you meet me at Walmart, you'll call me brother. <laughs> and that is okay. We use that. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. But when Epaphroditus is calling, uh, when Paul is calling Epaphroditus my brother in this text, it's not because he forgot Epaphroditus' name, because he's already mentioned him in verse 25. Okay? So what, what he means actually in this verse is the, the, uh, the word there, my brother, means members of the same family to those who are united in the bonds of affection. People are striving for the same cause, the cause of Christ, united. He calls him my brother because he knows what Epaphroditus is all about. It's all about advancing the gospel. And so therefore, he's my brother in Christ. Amen. That is what Paul is referring to when he says my brother. And that's what, when we're referring to each other's brothers, we all know we're advancing the cause of Christ, the gospel. We're taking the gospel. We are that light. Here at Rose Park Baptist Church, we are that light Amen. that you're taking the light around and people can see that you are the light Amen. that Christ said uh, we ought to be. So Epaphroditus is balanced in that area. Now, I want to develop, uh, I have a series uh, about Epaphroditus' life. You can really see that I love Epaphroditus. Uh, I want to develop his, uh, all the aspects about uh, his balanced life, but we can see that Epaphroditus is balanced in his walk as a, uh, as a brother, and we also see that Epaphroditus is balanced in his work as a servant. Uh, Paul says, and a companion, in the same verse, very loaded verse, Paul says, yet I suppose it's necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, and companion. That word companion is the word fellow worker. So Epaphroditus, we see that he worked with Paul and not against Paul. And that's what we're all supposed to be doing as Christians. We're in this race together. Nobody's supposed to be better than the other one. Nobody, Amen. we are in this race to help each other be better. Yes. And so that is what Epaphroditus was, a fellow worker, a companion. So as Rosebuck Baptist Church, that's what we ought to be. That's what Epaphroditus was to Paul. And that's what we all ought to be, fellow worker, working together, striving for the cause of the gospel. Yes. So we see that Epaphroditus was balanced in, in that area. As a, uh, um, as a servant, and also we see that he, he was balanced in his warfare as a soldier. Epaphroditus was balanced in his warfare as a soldier. Paul says in the same verse, his comp uh, and a companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger. Okay, very important verse there, uh, aspect. Fellow, uh, fellow soldier, and I mentioned this in Sunday school. If you were to look around in the world today, Things are not looking pretty. In terms of just war, what is going on? But that is just one area. But who is the real enemy? According to uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, we know who is the real enemy. It's the devil. The devil is out to destroy. And so when, Epaph when Paul calls Epaphroditus fellow soldier, it's because Epaphroditus and Paul knows who the real enemy and they're striving to take the gospel forth and so that the devil can be defeated. If we are fighting each other as Christians and we're forgetting who's the devil, the enemy is winning all the time, actually sitting back and smiling. It's like, yeah, they're fighting. That's what, the, that's what the devil wants us to be doing, not to be taking the gospel out. And so we ought to be fellow soldier, fellow soldier together 
fighting the enemy and not fellow soldiers fighting one another in that aspect. So Epaphroditus is balanced in that area. In that aspect, Epaphroditus is really balanced in his life, if we're to really look in his life. And I have a whole series really developed about Epaphroditus in terms of his balanced life. So we see that there's a great need in this uh, today for the people who are willing to stand against the evil in the world, like Epaphroditus. The devil is trying to take down a lot of blessing that we enjoy as Christians. The devil doesn't want us to enjoy the blessing we have as Christians. He wants to take them away. And so we need some, uh, some people, some Christians who, who will stand boldly to take the stand for the Bible. This is something that is not uh, common today, to take a stand for the Bible and the church, especially for holiness in the church. Churches cannot afford to compromise to accommodate worldliness. Amen. And, and today, this is happening all over in churches, sadly. Uh, we have to accommodate worldliness to get the number. But that is not what God has called us to do. Amen. So God wants us to be loving Christian. We see from verse 25 that love, uh, a, lovely, a, lovely, a loving Christian is somebody who's balanced, like Epaphroditus, just three areas. He's balanced in his walk, his work as a servant, and also in his warfare as a soldier. And so we see that the second thing is that a balanced Christian, uh, a loving Christian, sorry, a loving Christian is a Christian who's burdened, who's burdened, who has a burden for others. In verse 26 through 29, if I may read the verses. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that he had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him only, and not on him only, on him, but not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Verse 25, I send him therefore the more carefully that when ye see him again ye may rejoice and that I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and whole search in reputation. What was the focus of Epaphroditus' body? What was his focus? Verse 26 through 27 tells us that Epaphroditus was very sick. In fact, the Bible says he was sick nigh unto death. Now, let me pause here. You know when I'm sick, what I'm thinking? And my wife knows me better. You know, when I'm sick, I'm thinking about myself. I'm thinking well, I have a cold, I like this kind of soup. If my wife can prepare me that soup, I think I'll be okay. Now, at the same time, if somebody asks me a favor when I'm sick, I want them to know that I'm sick, and that's why I can't offer them the service they want. I want everybody to know when I'm sick. I don't know about you, but when I'm sick, I'm really down. And so, can you put a word out there that, this is about a cold. Now, not to make fun of people who are really struggling, because there are people who are sick, okay? And physically, they cannot. But I'm talking about when I have a cold. That is the fun part that I'm making. I'm making fun when, I'm, when I have a cold. But at the same time, I want people to know. But I want you to know something about Epaphroditus, that the, the Bible says, the verse says, that Epaphroditus, whatever sickness, sickness he had, he was sick nigh unto death. But I want you to know something about Epaphroditus that makes him really different from me. I don't know about you, but different from me. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that he had heard that he had been sick. Epaphroditus was really sad. That, that phrase, full of heaviness, we see that same word described about Jesus when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, when he was about to head to the cross, that it says, the same word says he was heavy. And that same word is the word full of heaviness that is used here, describing about Epaphroditus, knowing about the people at Philippi hearing that Epaphroditus was sick. I don't know about you, this person, his focus was not on himself. Because he was a minister to the church, 
at Philippi, and he did not want them knowing what was going on in his life. Quite a testimony. He had heard that they had heard he'd been sick, and he was burdened because he, he was worried. The reason why Epaphroditus is so heavy, it's because he's worried about the people at Philippi, back at Philippi. His focus is not on his own condition or needs. His focus is on, on others and their welfare. In other words, Epaphroditus was displaying absolute Christ-likeness that is talked about in Philippians 2.5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Yeah. And which mind was in Christ Jesus? Verse 6 of that same verse. Who being in, form of, in the form of God, thought it no robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the, the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. That is the mind of Christ. Being God did not consider himself being God, but took himself form of man. And what is man? Uh, again, in one passage, somebody asked, what is man that you will be thinking of him? That you are considered considerate of him. He didn't take a form of an angel, took a form of a man, God, taking a form of a man. The, that is the Christ-likeness, um, uh, that is the mind of Christ that Epaphroditus is display, displaying here. What a lesson for the church. How many of us cannot see farther than the end of our noses? We are so caught up at the, what is happening around us that we are unable to see the needs of others. We, maybe I come to church and probably I want to see what the church can offer me. And that is not the church of Christ. I believe the church of Christ, the local church of Christ, is me coming to serve others and not what I can get from the church, from others. Sometimes I need to come to church so that I can be an encouragement to somebody else yeah. and not the other way around. That is, that is Epaphroditus for you. Epaphroditus was not seeking to be served, but to serve others regardless of his condition. Yes, brother. Epaphroditus was a living, breathing commentary of Philippians. Again, the same chapter, verse two, chapter 2, verse 4, which says... Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. That is Epaphroditus for you. Amen. If you want to see what that verse means, look at the life of Epaphroditus. That is what that verse means, Epaphroditus. He was not looking on his own things, but on things of others. He was the essence, Epaphroditus, of Galatians 6, 2, which says, Bear you one another's burden and so fulfill the law of Christ. Epaphroditus was all what we ought to be. What about the fruit of his burden? We've seen the focus. The fruit of his burden, we see that in verse, tw uh, verse 28 through 29. We've already read the verses. We see these words, rejoice and gladness. Paul uses this word in verse 28 and 29, rejoice and gladness. The Philippians knew what a treasure they heard in Epaphroditus, so did Paul. He was the kind of person who made you feel important and loved. He put you first. Epaphroditus put you first, and you knew it. You knew that he put you first. You know, I think my wife puts me all first all the time, because when she asks me during the week what I want to eat, I say Chick-fil-A, so I think she's considered it that, that way, <laughs> because then then I get what I want. But that's not Epaphroditus. When Epaphroditus puts you first, he puts you first regardless of his condition. Regardless of what is, hap what is happening to him, you would know that Epaphroditus had put you first. He was an encourager. As a result, he was a joy to be around. How do people react when they see you coming? Do they cringe as they wonder what criticism they're about to hear? 
Do they dread at your coming because they, they know your attitude is going to be negative and self-centered? Do they avoid you because they're afraid you will give them an organ recital as you name the affliction and trouble that you have? Is that what people see when they see you coming? Is that what, is that what you give people? Or are you an encourager? Regardless of what, what is going on in your life, people are going to see that he's going to encourage me. We need to be encouragers. We need to be encouragers. I have a friend of mine, a very close friend. His name is Louis. Uh, in Puerto Rico, the Bible college student really uh, grew, uh, really encouraged me. Uh, ever since I arrived at the college, I don't know how long his wife was in uh, hospital. I never saw his wife, not even once uh, as a college student. But I knew his wife was not at home. She was in the hospital the whole time uh, in the machine. She couldn't breathe. She had a condition. But Louis never missed Sunday. He was the usher. Every time the announcement, I knew Louis's wife, Louis, uh, Louis's wife was sick. That's all I knew. But when I saw Louis every time as an usher on Sunday, he smiled, and every time he's asking me about my week, I'm like, what is happening to this guy? This, 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 there's something different about him. I, his, I mean, his wife is now with the Lord. But the whole time, he... He was an Epaphroditus. He was an Epaphroditus, a very close friend of mine. He was an Epaphroditus for sure. Never looked on his own condition. Always smiling. Always smiling, even knowing what was going on in his life. He was an Epaphroditus, I believe that. I don't know about you, but I want to be an encourager Amen. moving forward. I want to be an encourager. God wants us to be loving Christian, loving Christian, a balance with their work, loving Christian, a burden. And lastly, a loving Christian is a brave Christian. A lovely Christian is a brave Christian. We're going to see this in verse 30. Uh, this is what verse 30 says. Because for the work of Christ was nigh unto death, but not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. Now, the first phrase, it's so easy to read this verse and not pay attention to what it's saying. Because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death. Do you realize the words that are written there? like in Epaphroditus' eulogy, because for the work of Christ. Now, Hebrews 9.27, as it is appointed for man wants to die. Everybody, one day, we know, unless, unless the Lord tarries, uh, if the Lord tarries, we, that is, we're heading there. And I don't know what is going to be in my eulogy, but I just love the testimony here, Epaphroditus' testimony, because for the work of Christ. If Epaphroditus was going down, it's because of the work of Christ. That verse, that is a very powerful verse, very powerful verse. He was nigh unto death, not regarding his life. Not regarding his life. An ancient church tradition seems to indicate that where Epaphroditus was walking, most people would not even dare to go near because of the condition that where he was serving, the people that he was serving, people there in Rome, the sick in Rome, People didn't want to go near those people. That is the condition where Epaphroditus was working. In other words, he put everything on the line for Jesus in order to fulfill the Great Commission. What are you putting on the line to fulfill the Great Commission? Amen. For this man, nothing in this life was more important than doing the will of the Lord, even if doing the will of God required his own life. Wouldn't it be a blessing to have a team of Epaphroditus today in our churches? People who, men and women who know, knew no greater goal in life than to be obedient to the will of the Savior. You know, sadly today, it's all about convenience. It's not convenient for me. If it's not convenient, I won't, I won't do it. I won't, sorry. It's not convenient. So we see that there's bravery in his service because of what he was doing for Christ. But also we see that there's bravery in his sacrifice. The Bible says not regarding his, his life. 
not regarding his life. It literally means, this phrase literally means he gambled his life. The phrase means to throw down, to throw aside, throw down. It speaks of voluntary hazarding one's welfare and exposing one's self to danger. It's a time used to describe gamblers when they put their money down and they're not expecting it back. That is what this phrase means. That is what it used to refer back in the time, and I'm pr pretty sure it applies today too. Putting, when the gamblers put their money down and they, they, ex they were exposing it to danger of losing it. And so Epaphroditus was doing the same with his life when it says not regarding his life in verse 30. In other words, Epaphroditus willingly gambled his life in the for the cause of Christ. He put his life on the line to see Paul's needs met and the church at Philippi needs met. And you see, you know, you know who delivered the book of Philippians to Philippi? Epaphroditus. He's the one who delivered this book that we have, the precious book of joy that we, as we refer. It's Epaphroditus who delivered it to the church of Philippi. Most of us know this uh, quote from Jim Elliot. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He's no fool what, uh, who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. The proprietors knew at the end of the day he cannot keep his life. But you know what? Matthew chapter 6 talks about the treasures in heaven where moth nor rust cannot touch. Yeah. You can't lose those. I hope uh, that's what we're doing uh, with our life today, investing those treasures, heavenly treasures that Jesus is talking about in, ch in Matthew chapter 6. Where are the gamblers today? In the casinos? I believe that's where they are. Where are the saints of God who will allow nothing, be it comfort, convenience, or cause, stand between them and doing the will of God? Today. We need some brave believers in our day today. People who are willing to deny themselves, take up the cross, and follow Jesus. This is what the church needs today. And I'm, I dare say that when you risk all for Jesus, you're not losing anything. Amen. Because in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, again, what does it say? For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Are you a brave Christian as you can be today, putting all on the line for Christ, holding back nothing, but going all the way for him, and letting Christ worry about the consequences? God wants us to be loving Christians. A loving Christian is a balanced Christian. A loving Christian is a burdened Christian. And a loving Christian is a brave Christian. Yes. Are, you a, as, are you a loving Christian today? All heads bowed and eyes closed as Pastor Rob comes. All right. Let's pray. Our dear Father, thank you for a wonderful day you've given us today. Thank you, Lord, for this message. Pray, Lord, that uh, it was a blessing to your people here in the morning service, Lord. Lord, help us to be loving Christians, just like Epaphroditus displays his character in the, in, in the Bible. Just a few verses about this person, Epaphroditus, but my, the things, the character that he displayed. Lord, help us to be that kind of a Christian. Lord, moving forward in our society, everything is changing so fast. Lord, people are not even living for you anymore. And sadly, even it's creeping into the churches. And we're not even doing the same. We are living for self. And it's all about what I can, offer, uh, what I, uh, what I can get to, from the church and not what I can give in terms of service. Lord, help us to be loving Christian, just not regarding what we can get, uh, what, uh, our lives, but in aspect as, we, as, as you see fit and as we see the divine appointment coming and even the household of faith, the people in the church, help us to serve one another in a loving way and, and just absolute Christ-likeness, Lord, displaying that Epaphroditus kind of character. Lord, we pray that, uh, again, you used your word, Lord, to help us be different, change us. Is it, is it a mirror in our character, uh, Lord, to really live for you again? Thank you again for the opportunity to preach here, uh, Lord. Uh, dismiss us, Lord, in loving kindness and all the aspects that we have to do in uh, the remaining of the service, Lord, pray that uh, you just bless in Christ my prayer. Amen. We'll stand this morning with heads bowed and eyes closed.
as musicians begin to play a verse of invitation.